Uh, thanks very much. Um, I feel like we're in a lineup here. Uh, so <laughs> uh, we're just going to stand to the, the side. And what we'll do is I'm going to do a lot of the introductions and talk to you about why and how we did this project. And then I'm going to pass the microphone off to uh, the other uh, researchers here. Uh, these are the objectives that we're going to do. We're going to talk to you about what SCADA systems do, what they're used for, what PLCs are. And they're in a lot more places than uh, we initially thought when we started our research uh, last summer. About last March is when we started doing a lot of this. And since then, a lot of people have asked us for uh, comments and assistance and saying, hey, there are these PLCs in this location or this type of facility. And we're like, wow, we didn't know that. It's, it's kind of scary. And in fact, what it really imparts, what we want to impart in this presentation is PLCs are a lot more places than people think. And if you work in a facility or have a facility that have programmable logic controllers, education and training your employees about uh, just proper computer usage is a big deal. Because as we'll discuss, there are some bugs that are not going to be fixed. The manufacturers have said no patches are coming. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of a big deal with that. We're going to recommend some solutions as well. Um, this is me. Uh, I, I have some degrees, a uh, bachelor's in science, an MBA, and a JD. And right now I'm an attorney and cybersecurity engineer for Battelle Institute. It's a defense contractor, and I work out of Columbia, Maryland. And I'm not doing anything with, with SCADA right now, except this project is, uh, that we did here is not at all um, uh, my employers. This is independent security research we did uh, on, with our own funds. So I don't speak at all today for my employer, Battelle, but that's where I'm working right now. I'm also an adjunct professor at the University of Southern Maine in the Computer Science Department. I teach information security and law there. Um, I have some academic backgrounds that uh, have added a lot to uh, the classes that I teach. I've studied in China and England, a lot of different places. And I've done a lot of information security presentations. Uh, but this one is, uh, was exciting to us because uh, we just thought, what if we could do something similar to, uh, well, looking at how the code worked for Stuxnet. Stuxnet gave us this idea to do this kind of research. And I'll let my father, this is my father, John Strauss, by the way, and you'll see from his background how I grew up learning how to break into things uh, to make things more secure. And uh, it's how I, I got to where I am is from some of his, uh, the work he's done. I'm uh, primarily a physical security person. Uh, I've never liked that term, but it distinguishes from IT and cyber. If you think about it, physical security is almost entirely electronic. But that's what I've, I've done for a long, many years, is as I designed, that is, I developed the drawing specifications and design of physical security systems, access control, closed circuit TV, intrusion detection, and the like. And, and part of that, of course, is I've, I've done a lot of correctional facilities, uh, well over 100. And I am Teague Newman. I am basically a penetration tester. Um, I'm also an instructor for core security technologies. I've done a few CTFs, and this is just what I enjoy doing. And I have to give, we all give very a lot of credit to uh, our exploit writer named Dora the SCADA Explorer. Yeah. Because the exploit we created, we've, we've found to be um, rather uh, dangerous. And just to let you know from the beginning, we did not release our exploit in any way or shape or form. Uh, it's, we still have it. We're not giving it to anyone, because when we did the research, we realized how dangerous it potentially could be in the wrong hand. So uh, Dora wrote this for us, and Dora works in uh, the tropical area of Columbia, Maryland. And uh, we want to give Dora a lot of thanks for um, assisting us with this project. And we also want to comment, uh, the red team always wins. Uh, in the industry in particular that my father's in, if there's a door in a facility, there's always a way to get in. So doing red team projects is a lot of fun. We get hired to break stuff and break into places. But the harder job is securing those facilities. Uh, blue team type of stuff. It's uh, so when you any type of system, there's always a way in, and the harder part is doing the security to to uh, lock that stuff down. So uh, this project was easy in that sense, and uh, we're hoping that some of the manufacturers, the PLC manufacturers, uh, start putting out some patches. Some will, some will not, and we'll talk to you about which ones toward the end. Um, why present about prison vulnerabilities? Um, after our presentation, and we did this first time in DEF CON last year, uh, we had someone from a state in the U.S. who was a chief information security officer tell us thank you. He said, I've been fighting for more money for improving information technology security within correctional facilities, and he said, your presentation just did just that. He said, we're going to be doing more training, we're uh, reviewing some of the IT that we have there, because no one ever really thought that information security IT and information um, 
information technology relates to physical security. There was a divide between the two, and my father's going to talk about that. And that's why we have physical security and electronic security of people on this team, is that these groups really need to start working together more. But um, we wanted to support the warden. Um, and uh, we also wanted to scare the prison guards. We'll talk to you, uh, we'll give you some pictures we took in a facility where when Teague and I went in and did a walkthrough at a correctional facility in the U.S. and the Midwest, um, we saw people on the control computers for the PLCs checking their email on Twitter, on Facebook. These, this is not that the law enforcement officers, you know, they, their job is to watch the screens and make sure people don't break out. They did not know what PLCs were. They did not know why you should follow some of the um, secure computing type of policies at the prisons. They just thought they're bored. It's online, which is another thing. It's online straight out to the internet. They're going to check email. But uh, the computer we saw was really slow, and the guards were saying, we don't know why this is so slow. We try to check email. It takes forever. We're looking at it. We're like, is it probably has a problem? <laughs> so uh, we also, uh, this is part of the uh, responsible disclosure. That's one of the specialties that, that I've done more from the legal perspective is how to get information security uh, research out to the groups that need to know. And we did not go to CERT initially with this. We went straight to um, the, the agencies, in particular the FBI, Department of Justice, Federal Bureau of Prisons. This was their vulnerability. We wanted to tell them first. So what we did is uh, we set up a meeting with um, heads of about four agencies in DC, agreed to meet with us. And it was uh, an interesting meeting. They all you could see who was with which agency because they weren't really communicating. They were sitting on opposite ends of the table and we were at the head. It was, it was quite interesting to see that. But uh, we wanted to tell them about this stuff because it applied to a lot of the work that some of them were doing. So um, this is, they, some of them said we can't say what agency they're from, so we have some stuffed animals that uh, will, will do that uh, for us. <laughs> All right, and I'm going to let my father talk to you about the story of Christmas Eve. Now, mind you, this is not um, a type of exploit, type of malicious attack. Um, but this just goes to show, as we found out in Las Vegas, if you put a new like, copying machine in your office, in your wherever facility has PLCs, if it changes the voltage, like a little bit of a brownout, uh, things can happen. So this is one of these examples. So when I took my Stuxnet research, talked to my father about this that I remembered him telling me many years ago, uh, we thought, what if we could open up the doors in prison? So I'll let him talk to you about that. Well, he, he basically did. <laughs> Uh, when I heard about Stuxnet and the fact that they were using a Siemens PLC, I thought about that a minute and I said, wait a minute, uh, I've, done, I've designed, I've done the engineering for well over 100 correctional facilities, that is prisons, jails, and so forth. I said, they all use PLCs. Now, let me uh, correct a misconception I've heard already. The vast majority of electronic security systems, and that is physical security systems, don't use PLCs. They use controllers, smart multiplexers, and others. But the one area in the security realm that does use PLCs is correctional facilities. And the reason is, is the back then, remember, this PLC technology goes back over 40 years. And back then, what you wanted to do in, in, in lieu of expensive multiplexing, a PLC was a cheap, easy way of controlling hundreds of points. And not only that, but the PLC used ladder logic, which literally, like a ladder, it was very easy to trace the system from point to point to make sure that this button opens up this door. Very simplistic, and that's exactly, it's doing today what it was supposed to do 40 years ago. So anyway, long story short, I made a connection that maybe there's a problem here after I heard about Stuxnet, is because I remembered in a situation where I had done a uh, maximum security prison that had a death row in the United States. And on Christmas Eve, I got a call from the warden. All the doors had popped open on death row. In fact, throughout most of the prison. So we ran out there and we found out that uh, uh, the contractor had not followed specs. It wasn't that they did it wrong, it's that they married up two pieces of equipment, that is two manufacturers that were not specified. In theory, it should have worked, but these two particular manufacturers had never been used together. And in this case, what it turned out the problem was that a one-way diode was leaking voltage enough. Remember, all we need is uh, millivolts to trip these sensors. And it, it popped all the doors open. So from that, I kept thinking about that. I said to myself, well, that happened accidentally. 
What could you do if you did something deliberately going after the same problem? The fact that it's a PLC and you're dealing with millivolts and uh, you're dealing with very simple ladder logic, which has absolutely no part of it has any security concern at all because 40 years ago, a virus meant you got a bad cold. Hence, our investigation. And as you mentioned, it started with Stuxnet. Um, uh, this Stuxnet uh, research, a lot of it, we uh, actually got inspiration from some of Kaspersky's work. So it was great to see the presentation yesterday on the Duke here and their, their tie-in um, with what they're doing researching Stuxnet. So uh, that's where we got a lot of that. And also some of my discussions with uh, Tom Parker, who's also a fantastic uh, information security researcher, and uh, FX at um, Black Hat Abu Dhabi. And we got back, we started thinking about this, and uh, that's how this came about, and why we're talking about integrating more with physical security with IT and InfoSec. So Stuxnet for Correctional Facilities, could it be done? Uh, when we first started the project, we weren't sure. So um, we asked uh, to get a tour of a facility, and, and he's going to go over some of those pictures. That. So uh, this is the background. It gives you a little bit of an idea of where uh, my father's, some of his training came from about breaking into places so other people can't break in. It, it is the Culinary Institute of America, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, I don't know. This isn't really relevant. Because we, uh, <laughs> we can't play the sound clip. You can't say, <laughs> everyone knows it. Everyone knows the sound clip is. It's uh, Ben Kingsley saying, yeah. It's ones and zeros. It's all about the information. So yeah, I was uh, the consultant true. for sneakers. In fact, uh, uh, I'm Sidney Poitier, and Marty sort of was uh, pattern after me. Microphone. Microphone. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm gonna let Teague talk about this one actually. All right. So uh, basically, with Stuxnet, it was directed against Step Seven. The somatic software. So there were a couple of, okay, it, they breached the machine via, uh, I believe, a Microsoft attack, which was, I think it was in Office, I can't exactly remember. Supposedly there were some Microsoft patches that would have helped fix this. Um, actually it appears maybe RPC with MS 08067. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> they breached the machine and then they went in and they directly attacked the somatic software and that's how they were able to get in and start manipulating the PLCs. So. And now it's all about the PLCs. What we'll do at the end of this presentation is we have more uh, vulnerabilities for facilities and national infrastructure that we have found, and this is the part that's new, very new to the presentation, some as of like news of last week that we'll talk about. So what we're trying to do is not to cause like hyper hysteria, like scare people about it, but if you work in these facilities or work in policy or with legislation, this, this needs to be watched very carefully because a lot of stuff has actually changed in the past two months that I think has elevated a little bit of the security risks for this. And uh, because most people don't know, prisons and jails uh, have these PLCs. That's where we wanted to start. And clearly it's not the type of thing where we'll write a proof of concept and walk into a prison and run it. Because if we were right, uh, we don't want all the jail doors uh, popping open. So uh, what we did is we took a tour and then we also wrote the um, exploit and we tested it on our own systems. Um, this is something that is interesting that I'm going to let you go on because this is about the structure of the prison facilities. The uh, difference, uh, I don't know how relevant or important it is, but the difference between a prison and a jail, what's a prison? A prison is typically a federal or state facility where incarceration is a year or to life. A jail, on the other hand, is, tends to be a local correctional facility and incarceration is usually a year or less. But the problem with a jail is some of them are huge. I mean, there are, we have jails that have five to 6,000 inmates. And a lot of times, people that are awaiting trial are in a jail because they haven't been convicted yet, which means you could have anybody from a pickpocket to a mass murderer in a jail awaiting trial. So jails, in some sense, are even more sensitive than prisons are because they're before classification. And one of the things that we saw in the prison, um, the jail, was a jail actually that Teague and I visited, was that uh, often when uh, they're transporting people awaiting trial through corridors, and there was a brand new corridor built in this facility, inmates are passing judges in the hallways as they go from the judges, from their uh, chambers to the, tr the courtroom. And if you can get into some of the PLCs, we also found that the, um, 
some of the cameras, uh, closed circuit TVs. You could also, if you were in this system, watch what's going on in the facility as if you're in the control room. And there's a like a huge number. Uh, there's 117 federal correctional facilities, 1,700 prisons, 3,000 jails in America, and then there are about 160 that are operated by private companies. Almost all of them, except for the very small ones, use PLCs in their system architecture. And again, that's 40-year-old technology. Uh, that's, that's me. <laughs> now, just to give you a, a general idea of how you, how you design a prison, or at least a modern prison, or a large jail, it always has a central control, and that's the brain. That's where all the, uh, the equipment that does the switching and the, and, and the monitoring occur. And around it are the pods, the, ha the housing units. Each of those, a lot of times, will have their own control. But there's always a central control, a central brain. That's an overhead aerial view of a, uh, one of the, a, a maximum security prison. There may be hundreds of cells, and all but the smallest ones, except like smallest jails, will have a control center. And that is, in fact, one of the control centers we designed. It's a touchpad type of a control panel. And here again, you have the control center, and you have some place there. It'll be an equipment room, typically, usually right next door, even sometimes underneath the cabinetry, but some kind of workstation where you manage the system. It then controls solenoids or motors, depending on the kind of lock. Some are pneumatic, some are electromechanical. It will be a solenoid or motor, and then in that lock will be sensors or limit switches. All of these points will be monitored by a PLC. This is the next slide. Yeah. And yeah. there are ancillary systems, closed circuit TV, duress alarms, intercoms. Uh, keep going. And when we, mind you, when we get into the control computer, we can control all this as well. Yeah, when you get in any part of it, you can control any part of it. There will be a perimeter, particularly in high-security high uh, prisons. There will be an outdoor uh, roving patrol. A lot of times they're connected with Wi-Fi, which, again, when they, these were designed, that wasn't a concern of anybody. But the, you got radio signals being bled, bled out in a perimeter fence. And they're all controlled by rack-mounted PLCs, which then control relay banks, which then control solenoids, motors, and then monitor sensors. That's a prison system. In addition to the uh, systems, uh, security systems, a lot of times there'll be public telephone that's controlled. That is, there's an on-off switch. There might be a patch into the public phone system through the intercom. They control day room TV, lighting, showers, water, all of it going back to a one point on a PLC. Okay, and again, while you're looking at this, I, I don't think any of you have seen or been in the inside of a prison. Hopefully you never will see the inside of one. But think about how this applies to other types of facilities, like even nuclear power plants. Once you're on the control computer, how much you can do. And that's just a simple block diagram. Again, just repeating what I've been saying, saying before. There are 40 to 50 manufacturers of PLCs. I, I, I kind of feel sorry for Siemens. They seem to be picked on, but because they're not the only one. In fact, they're not the most popular uh, PLC for prisons or correctional facilities. They're one of the least, least used. Uh, they're more in industrial controls than they are in prisons. And other security researchers have looked at some of these and exploits we found online um, are available for some of these. But GE Fanucs was interesting because if you, want, if you, if you run a facility and you want your, um, your updates, it has to be connected to the internet. You don't have a choice or you don't get the service contract. So a lot of facilities uh, do want those. Do you want to comment about that? Yeah, so it was... <clears throat> It was just basically for the service contract. Uh, it was required to be online so GE could access it remotely. Well, in a lot of government stuff, when you buy things, you're required to purchase a service contract with it. So that kind of makes it scary right there in itself. Yeah, in fact, let me uh, just, one of the criticisms we've heard since we've been doing this presentation is that, uh, particularly like the Federal Bureau of Prisons saying, well, we don't, we don't have any internet connections. It's ridiculous. Well, first of all, that's not true.
But the most important point, I think, is that Idaho National Laboratory did some independent research, and one, they, va they validated our research and what we had done, 100% validation. But they went out and looked at, I think it was, what? 400. 400 facilities that were supposed to be air-gapped, no internet connections. There wasn't one of them that was not connected to the internet. And this information was actually shared uh, via uh, DHS. Um, so uh, every one security. of the 400 that was not supposed to be connected to the internet was connected to the internet. Sometimes not in an obvious way, but remember, all you got to have is one part being connected, and you're in. Yeah, I mean, in that case, <clears throat> it really comes down to obviously things like proper network segmentation, uh, et cetera, which in what we saw, it was not properly segmented whatsoever. So that's clearly another big issue. And in fact, on this slide, let me, uh, something worth looking at here is, is what's the fix? Well, uh, Tiffany and Teague will talk about it a little bit more uh, shortly, but I don't know how many PLCs exist in North America, but I'm, my guess is, wild guess, somewhere between 15 and 20 million. If you can, not just prisons, but everywhere. Now you look at it and say, okay, it doesn't have to be ladder logic could be any other language, you can have a more robust language. Can you imagine the cost of the man hours to go back, reprogram 15 to 20 million PLCs? It doesn't have to be uh, PLCs. It could be smart multiplexing. You could switch it. But can you imagine the cost of switching out 15 to 20 million pieces of hardware with something else? Monumental cost. It's, it's not fixable because of finance. One of the things to remember here with uh, PLC's implementation in prisons, they weren't looked at as part of the network, essentially. Um, <clears throat> what was the percentage of cost for wiring and stuff, John? Do you remember? Uh, with copper? 20, 20 to 40%. Yeah, it was like 20 to 40% of the cost of a prison goes into wiring. And so what the PLC's actually did is they were implemented to cut down that initial build cost so they weren't looked at as a computer, they were basically looked at as wiring. So instead of home running everything from those hubs to the spoke, you know, from every single cell running like tons and tons of wires, you just run it down to the PLC and then one wire from the PLC back to central control. So you got to take this into account, like John said, they're going to be all over the place and they're not always going to be considered part of the computer network, you know, because a lot of these places they're implemented long before and then as time has passed, they just plug them in. Yeah, LonWorks is the most popular protocol, and the only purpose of LonWorks is to reduce wire and conduit costs, because it's such a huge part of overall construction costs. So while, of course, we've mentioned that reprogramming all this is not is not going to be, uh, it's, it's very expensive. We have some remedial um, type of recommendations at the end. So it, you know, if you're waiting for a patch to come out for your PLC, maybe it will, maybe it won't. It, a lot have not, a few have come out. Uh, so there are other very simple, um, kind of simple ways to just, it's just changing the way that your employees and you think about this as uh, part of your security system. Um, actually, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, we're talking about thousands of points per facility. That's, again, what the PLC is supposed to do. Here's a schematic of a pneumatic sliding door. Most prison doors these days are pneumatic, not electromechanical. Pneumatic simply work better. This one door, for example, in this example, has 34 points that have to be monitored. Just one door. Multiply that by several hundred doors, and you can get a sense of how many thousands of points exist in a, in a large facility. And again, that's part of the vulnerability. And here, for example, going back to Stuxnet, one of these points, for example, controls uh, speed reducing. I can make these doors, these pneumatic doors, particularly the piston type, fire like a machine gun until it destroys itself. So I mean, you can break a two by again. four with a pneumatic door if you take the uh, limit switches off. It's that powerful. So it's not only you can open doors and, or prevent doors from opening, you can actually destroy a door if you have access to these, these circuits. And the limit switch that, to which he's referring is uh, a program. If yeah. you change uh, one aspect of this, uh, you can change that. And then perimeter gates as well. You could open up, up, the, up the gates because they're controlled by PLCs as well. All right, some of the vulnerabilities that we thought of, um, really thinking about if we, uh, which is some of the projects that we do.
if we look at this type of facility and theorize how would we break in or how would we break people out, these are the, some of the things that we, uh, we came up with. We'd open the doors and the gates. I mean, so we figured out that we could open it straight out. Um, and I'm sure many of you have probably seen the Mission Impossible movie, which was interesting. Uh, some people said they're already in post-production after we did this, but the whole opening scene, we're like, wow, there's a guy sitting in a van outside of the prison, controlling through the, the computer, like the cameras. He knows exactly where Tom Cruise is to get him out, opening up the doors for like, that's really funny. So it was interesting. But um, this is some of the stuff, just like in the movie, uh, we thought that we might be able to do. And again, we can cause some of the locks to go out of phase, prevent the doors or gates from opening. Um, emergency release entire, entire cell blocks. For instance, say lockdown, if you remember the spoke, you know, the hubs and the spoke. Lockdown some, but we want this one, everyone out. Maybe those are the, you know, well, there's I, someone in there that you would And, and let me explain to. cascading release. Again, I don't know how many electronic or electrical engineers are out there. But if I have hundreds of solenoids or electric motors, and I send out a command, open all of them right now, or close all of them right now, I get such a rush that it'll destroy the electronics. So the way a prison avoids that, that cascading problem is it cascades the, the signal. It says, uh, open this door, then a millisecond later, open that one, open that one, open that one, and that way you don't have that big rush. If I have access to the PLC, I can cut out the cascading program and get an inrush and it'll fry all electronics in that system. And uh, perimeter intrusion systems, they all have high uh, false and nuisance alarm rates. Uh, again, the, I can, if I have access to the PLCs, I can have access to the signals being sent by the fence intrusion detection system. So if someone's going through the fence, you're not going to get a signal back. We addressed this already, um, yeah. as was actually validated by DHS. They are connected to the internet in 400 facilities they looked at. And those weren't all correctional facilities. That was also stuff on the electrical grid. And, and you don't have to necessarily have a, a direct contact, a, a contact. You could also, going back to Stuxnet in Iran, if someone gets a thumb drive uh, smuggled into a facility, get that thumb drive on a system, and again, you can get infected all over again. And another one of the things people said is, well, it sounds like your you know, release is really improbable. You know, it's, it, it's only in the movies like Mission Impossible, uh, as that movie came out later. But we found out that, um, well, we thought, what other types of um, unlikely prison breaks have occurred? And so my dad's like, oh, Charles Manson. Yeah, <laughs> not supposed to have cell phones in a prison. Charles Manson was caught with uh, cell phones in a cell twice in one year. Now, how improbable is that? And I believe that was like super max, right? That wasn't even max. Yeah, in fact, what you just missed is parole hearing again. <laughs> uh, perimeter tool vehicles have wireless connections. That, that means there's a Wi-Fi signal out there. Telephone systems have a patch, so you could, in theory, go through a public telephone system and get patched through. And the whole time, central control is getting false status signals. In other words, we not only can change almost any switch in this circuit, but we can go back to central control, say, by the way, this, none of this is happening. Everything's fine, everything's green, no problem. And you're gonna see that when Teague talks to you about the exploit. So, uh, infection vectors from within without. Actually, Teague will take this. All right, well, I'll let you do from within. Okay, Actually, from- I'm gonna scoot over here, I'm getting shoved in the corner. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, technicians in the control room, well, as I mentioned to you, we saw people on Gmail, Actually, let's get a little bit more apart. Okay, on Gmail, things like that. Um, we One of the uh, theories of how Stuxnet occurred is that uh, someone who worked in one of the facilities in Iran uh, got a USB drive and maybe put it on his home computer, accessed the, uh, the facility's computer from like some network at, uh, from his home. Or it was actually taken in and put into a computer in their facilities. No one knows. But uh, when we, what we saw, all of the, the USB ports were you know, readily accessible in the, the computer that we saw. All right, so obviously from within, actually when we uh, went in the facility, the uh, security equipment room was beneath the central control. You actually had to go down a hatch and down a ladder to get in there. So when I went down the hatch, I had an escort with me, and there were a couple of guys in there working on the video over IP. And uh, so they were in there working on the video over IP, two guys completely unsupervised, and there was a third guy coming and going as he pleased. This was the same 
you know, server room where PLCs and everything else was computers that controlled them. So that's clearly a vulnerability there as well. Uh, so you have the, the human element, the contractors. Also, um, I'll actually have Tiffany talk about it a bit, but the guard in the facility was sitting there looking at Gmail. Yeah, and so. the reason I found out is I had high heels on and I didn't want to go down the ladder into the equipment room. <laughs> this wasn't going to work out well for me that way. So I, I stayed up and just uh, there, just talked to the guard. I wasn't, you know, social engineering, but I was asking them questions about how things work and all that. And then seeing that guard on Gmail and Twitter and stuff like that. And then complaining that the reason uh, she said that, she's like, yeah, these, the guys that work like the graveyard shift, it's boring up here because, you know, not much happens in this town. So they're, they're watching all these movies at night. And uh, now the computers are really slow and we're mad at them about it. There was no like comment about like we're cleaning it up or we run antivirus. I mean, it was uh, like these guys infected it or something and uh, it's a problem. It was more of a problem, I think, than, than that guard would have known. <laughs> this is the computer that controls the doors in the facility, so. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> all right. One of the connections we found was, okay, so another comment we got was like, okay, not all facilities, maybe you can hack in from like straight outside, like in a Starbucks, getting into the control computers in the prison. Well, we, we thought, okay, were there any other places that are more open to the public in the prison that we could use? And we found a connection between the commissary, because mind you, in some of the minimum security prisons, they have like Burger King and things like that, where they're receiving ship, you know, shipments of food and things. Jail. Yeah, jails, jails, not prisons. So uh, you can talk about that. Yeah, yeah anyway, so the, the commissary would have, <clears throat> would have basic network connections to place orders, to update stock, things like that. Um, and of course, if that's not properly segmented from the rest of the network, then in theory, that machine could be used to attack the others as well. And like I said, the network segmentation that we saw was less than desirable. All right, what kind of badness is possible? And actually, we'll, we'll share this one. Do you want to? Go for it. Okay. Uh, we wanted to open the doors, all the cell doors, to the yard, out into the facility. Um, and also, in the event of a fire, some of them have their own separate controls. And uh, actually, do you want to briefly mention fire for this? Uh, fire evacuation at jail or prison is a real, real concern. I mean, uh, inmates frequently start fires deliberately, mattress fires typically. Every year, some people die from smoke inhalation mostly, sometimes from direct fire deaths. So it's a, it's a big problem. Uh, if you can control any part of the system, I don't want to get too technical, but there's something called a re remote latch holdback in some doors. What it does is once you open the door, once you slam the door shut again, most of these are called slam locks, it prevents it from relocking. Otherwise, if somebody didn't like somebody behind him, say it's a gang of bloods and crypt thing, first guy goes through the door during a fire evacuation because he started the fire, he slams the door shut, everybody behind him burns to death or dies of smoke inhalation. So remote latch holdback prevents that from happening. Once a fire alarm goes off, remote latch holdback kicks in, you can't slam lock the door. Well, I can prevent that from happening. So if I wanted to assassinate somebody, I deactivate the remote latch holdback and then have someone start a fire. So um, release from prison, it's unlikely because uh, you know these types of hacks can't help you get by the guys with the gun. So you're, you know, that person will be on their own for that one. Um, but which is more likely? So we, we went through some of this um, as well. Uh, from what we saw, we thought, yeah, this is unlikely, but it could happen if someone was really motivated to do it. Is there something? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> All right. So this is uh, one thing to point out here. So yeah, it is unlikely, but it's pretty unlikely that somebody's going to fly a helicopter into a prison to break someone out. And uh, it's actually happened eight times over like the last 20 years or something, 30 years. And uh, six of which were initially successful. So that's also pretty unlikely, but it has happened as well. And on this type of comment, actually, someone from uh, some of the, someone from the federal government who talks talked about talked about APT, like Advanced Persistent Threat. He's like, forget China. People like you guys are APT. So, for instance, um, we'll show you how cheap it was to do the stuff that we did. So if you really, uh, if someone had a malicious intent to get someone out, it's, uh, it's not something that would take millions to do, not even close. <clears throat> so also, we can close doors. Uh, it's another thing that we thought we, was another possibility of concern for safety is during a fire evacuation, we'll just, just say, okay, they're all closed, no one's getting out, none of the doors are going to open. And he went through the slam locks as well already. So 
So if you did that, um, everyone would perish in the entire unit. So. All right, um, other facilities at risk, and I'm going to let Teague take this because some of these we, uh, a lot of this comes from people at, it's been interesting at conferences when we give this talk, someone will come up to us, and almost everyone we've done, and say, I can't tell you who I am or where I work, but I'm, I know, I've known about these vulnerabilities. I'm trying to get my boss and people to listen to me. So, um, you know, this research has helped, you know, me get some awareness at my own company about this, but did you know that this is vulnerable and that's vulnerable? And I, some of them we did not, so we've added some in here um, that uh, we've discovered recently as well. You know, this is kind of interesting too because initially one of the ideas when we started doing this project was actually, you know, okay, well, it's pretty, people are pretty aware that PLCs are in power facilities, water treatment, stuff like that. And we were just trying to figure out interesting places that PLCs were that maybe people would not have immediately thought of. You know, and so over the course of the year, we found out um, things, you know, like PLCs being used to control HVAC. So that's clearly important to a data center, right? So if someone is able to shut off the AC in a data center, I mean, okay, you know, best case, machines probably go offline because they overheat. Worst case, you know, machines start burning up and breaking badly if they're overheating, if it's left untended for a long period of time. Um, it's also been put through the rumor mill now that uh, amusement parks, rides are run with PLCs, so that has some pretty clear ramifications there. Uh, transit, that's a big deal as well. Public because, transit's obviously. Yeah, a we, we've, we've seen in the news um, a lot of, again, none of us have clearances. This is just all public information we have been able to find. But um, we found that uh, transit, there have been some recent uh, attempts to attack transit facilities, especially in uh, the uh, Northwest. Um, that, is, that was something that someone had done. And uh, braking systems and switches are controlled with the PLCs. Um, hydroelectric dams. Do you want to mention anything about that one? Because he's done security for some of them. Well, again, the, the limit switching on, uh, you know, some of these uh, generators, uh, uh, rotors. I remember uh, Chief Joseph Dam in Washington State, for example, they had a uh, General Electric uh, stator, I don't know, I guess what you call it, I mean, a huge generator. It was built in Canada and it took six months for it to be transported from Canada down to Washington State to be installed. And the American Indian Movement at that point was uh, was having problems with the Corps of Engineers. And someone with a ball-peen hammer hit, hit the wrappings a couple of times and it ruined the whole thing. Well, rather than something that's fisky, if I can get access to their PLCs that control the spin rate of these generators, I can have it self-destruct by simply having it spin until it destroys itself. Because back in, then again, nobody ever thought that this was a vulnerability. It just wasn't in the vulnerability at that time. And I think a lot of people who did know about these vulnerabilities um, were under security clearances or NDAs and things like that. For the past 30 years, this, this type of research, again, is not new. What was uh, happened to us after DEF CON is a federal agent came up to us and said, I mean, kind of jokingly, but not really. He's like, because of you guys and Dylan Beresford and Terry McCorkle and well, this Rios, uh, Billy Rios recently, he's like, uh, yeah, now everyone knows about it. And clearly, none of us here believe the security through obscurity model. I'm a college professor. I, I really believe that teaching people about information security and how things are broken makes them better able to design them with the next you know, version with this type of information security. And secure coding really is a top priority and not something you leave to IT to tack on at the end. So this type of security through obscurity, you know, I, I think people working at these facilities absolutely need to know that if you do not follow the corporate policies uh, for computer usage, you can have some pretty, there can be pretty devastating effects on your facilities. And you'd be surprised how many people that, you know, we talked to that worked in facilities said, I never knew there were PLCs. I did, I, they may be connected to the internet. So uh, one of the things that we're trying to do is say, yeah, they, they may be. Assume that they are and talk to IT about how you have your network set up. Some of the things too, like mining, it might not be immediately obvious. Um, so I grew up in northern Nevada. There's a lot of like gold mining and stuff that goes on there. And they have leach pits, which are basically filled with bad chemicals and stuff like that. So if you have PLCs controlling some of these things, you can be spilling out toxic chemicals. And so there, there's a lot of big problems as well. Gas pipelines, that's pretty obvious. You know, I mean, that's 
a lot of money that's going to go down the drain if things break there, like, in a hurry. So. And as my father mentioned earlier, these, these places have security systems. They're just not integrated with the PLCs or information security. Yeah, different correctional facilities, the PLC part of it is some kind of facility is typically not integrated with the physical security system of electronic system. They're separate. They shouldn't be, but they are. And I want to mention as we go into this about quickly how much this cost and how we did it, and we did it in our basement, that's absolutely true. Um, there was a 60 minutes overtime program that was done, and um, there's, some there's some incorrect things in that program. Um, it only featured me as the researcher, which is absolutely untrue. There were four of us on this project, and I made sure uh, 60 minutes just missed the other three. But um, this was a, a group project, and also they said that we didn't do this I think they commented, like, these aren't, like, script kitty hackers in their basements uh, in their pajamas doing this stuff. Okay, we may not be script kitties. We all have some background in this, but we actually did do this in our basement, maybe in pajamas as well. So that's wrong, too. <laughs> so the cost of this was actually pretty cheap. Like, initially, after Stuxnet came out, people were saying, oh, it would take, like, nation-state-level funding to do this. Uh, we found out that was completely incorrect. That was one of the things that I did not believe. So we went out. Um, I went on eBay. Bought a PLC kit for 500 bucks, and probably could have got it cheaper if I would have taken a couple of days and just ordered all the pieces separately, so all together. And then immediately after that, I went out on the internet to see if the somatic software was out there. And sure enough, it was pirated and on the internet. So realistically, at this point, someone malicious could acquire the PLCs for $500, and then they could go out and pirate the software. So the majority of our cost was actually in buying a license for the software. Um, I'm an attorney. I, I can't yeah, mess with stuff on it was, <laughs> it, it That was one of the things that took the longest, too. There was like 30, 40, 50 different versions of Somatic. And so I actually had to get on the phone with Siemens, and it took like two days on the phone with them to figure out which license I even needed to buy. And so the majority of our cost was in buying that license. The license for the software was $2,000. So the total cost of this project was $2,500, most of which was acquiring a legitimate license. So um, what you may have heard about, it takes nation-state funding. That is completely and totally incorrect. It takes 500 bucks and some malicious intent. <laughs> and any freshman could have written this type of exploit code. Yeah, that was the thing. College, yeah. So there's out there now, there's a whole handful of exploits. But if you look at some of the most basic, it's just straight-up buffer overflow on the stack. It's like 30 lines of code. It's, you know, when you're learning to write exploits, that's pretty well where you're going to start is right around there. And so it's, it's not as bad as you may think. Um, this is a picture of the uh, lab in the basement. That is it. Here's the PLC. It's just connected to a computer. There's our fancy $2,000 software. Um, that's it. That's all. And this is, I'm not going to go over this, but if you're in the, you know, development of software, ladder logic is pretty simple. If you understand the logic tables, that's it. This is all, you just have to pretty much make the pictures flow, and then you, you have software that works. Okay, so we're going to talk about this for a second, and then uh, we'll show you the demo. But basically, there are many public exploits available, okay? So Luigi, he has, uh, there was one day last year where he actually released 34 in one day since then. He's dropped a whole bunch more. I'm reasonably sure it's well over 50 now. Uh, so there's obviously exploits in Metasploit, and they are increasing as well with uh, Project Basecamp from Digital Bond. They've been, I think they released two more like last week. Um, obviously, some on Exploit DB. Uh, this one's interesting. So Terry McCorkle and Billy Rios, they, they had a plan. They were going to try and find 100 bugs in 100 days. All right, they found over 650 bugs. <laughs> So they greatly surpassed what they were looking for. 75 of those were easily exploitable. And then now, uh, within the last couple of weeks, there has been some stuff that has gone on with their research. You know, They disclosed everything, and they've been releasing these very phased. And um, what's going on is some of these vendors are saying, we're not going to fix these. their end of life, and that's it. So they get in there. And now you have these forever day bugs, all right? So the life cycle in ICS, the problem that we found is availability is of higher precedence than security sometimes. So the life cycle on some of these things is like six years between patching or replacement. So now you have these forever day bugs that are never going to get fixed, and this thing could be in service for six more years and vulnerable. So kind of a big deal. 
And actually, while, uh, do you want to set up the, the, we have like a two minute video yeah. that we're going to show and I'm going to finish out some of the slides for this. So um, our attack vector, similar to Stuxnet, we directly called PLC functions. We were able to suppress alarm notifications. So we're able to tell people in the control center, everything's good, all the doors are locked, no problem. Meanwhile, in reality, they're all open and you'll see that in the uh, very short demo that we have. So it's also on YouTube. So if you want to watch this, it's, uh, it's up there. It's been up there for a bit. This is what our PLC looked like, our little $500 uh, investment there. And I'm going to show you these pictures very briefly. We went, this is from our tour of the correctional facility. We, um, what was great is a law enforcement officer took all these pictures for us because we weren't allowed to bring a camera in, so he did it for us. And um, <laughs> some of the remediation um, is mostly just network security. I mean, know what's connected to what and how far it goes out and use your acceptable use policies. Train your employees that this is something that is vulnerable and uh, now is pretty well known. Let me just add, like I said, I've designed well over 100 uh, facility systems, security systems. Not once did I have an internet connection. Not ever. What happens is IT comes along and optimizes everything. And they add the connections that were never in the design to begin with for all kinds of good reasons. So just a quick note on this, um, what we're demonstrating is similar to Stuxnet where we did in fact consider the uh, computer compromised because the various things that we saw, how it would be able to do that. We did also do some separate stuff and we did actually attack the PLCs directly. In this case, what you're seeing though is we are, the attack is against the somatic software. It's going to look like that this is a module in Metasploit, but I promise you it is, it is not um, this available. This is not committed. <laughs> All right, so it basically what you're seeing right now is it's kind of hard to make out, but there's little switches down here. When you flip the switch, you know, it says, so picture this being door open or closed. So this is what you would see at the control center. This is what would be going on on the remote end, so at the door, okay? So when you say open the door, the door opens or the door closes. So the green lights are indicating that it's locked. I'll kind of skip through here. And you take a look, and the same things will occur in here. So it'll show you, you know, this would be like the controlling software that the guard would see. You hit a button that says lock it, the door unlocks, whatever. So now we're going over here and uh, just some interpreter script, jailbreak.rb. <laughs> uh, basically what it's doing is it's migrating into the process, which is somatic. And then from there, it's accessing the libraries that it has and calling functions to open and close the doors. So these are all physically locked, but when that run, you could see they still appear as locked, but everything had opened. All the lights went out, so that'd be all doors unlocking right there. And you notice in the software, everything still appears to be locked as well. So not only can we manipulate the end state, but we can manipulate the monitoring, you know, that the guards would see, the alarms, things like that, so. Okay, so as, as Teague switches it back uh, to the other computer, um, I'm just gonna say that we did not break or crack any crypto for this. Um, we used the program exactly for which it was intended, and there is no patch for the type of um, exploit that we did. There is no fix for it. So that just shows uh, one of the reasons why we never released the exploit. And um, here's our contact information. So if anyone has any questions, um, anything else they'd like to discuss about this. And if you want to actually uh, watch the video that features Dylan Brewersford Research, go to 60 Minutes Over Time. And it's their cyber war segment they did about a month ago. All right, thank you very much.